The 25th Hour Radio Show. I want to thank everyone for joining me today on the 25th Hour Radio Show. On the phone, I have former senior orca trainer of SeaWorld, John Hargrove, who is also a New York Times bestselling author. John, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me on. Now, now, John, am I saying this right? Is it orca or, or killer whale? I mean, how should I be referring to these beautiful animals? It, you know, you can say it either way. Uh, orca is the scientific name, and killer whale is the common name. Um, you know, so it's really just a, a personal preference. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter. So, John, I'm going to start this uh, interview off probably pretty much the same way everyone else has uh, when giving you an interview. And that's to ask how you came to be a, a killer whale trainer in the first place. Were you just thumbing your way through the classifieds one day and think, hey, this sounds interesting? <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was born and raised in the deep south. And um, in, you know, 73, I was born and uh, not much there, you know. And uh, usually animals are just viewed as work animals down there, and especially in that, that time frame of life. But... Um, always loved animals, even as a little boy, we always had all these strays and I wanted to be a vet because that's all I knew until I went to a sea world park when I was six and then I was just immediately hooked. I mean, once as a six year old seeing a show like that with the music and the lights and the, you know, 5,000 people, which was about the size of my town that I lived in, in orange, you know, population, you know, it's just a, it's just an incredibly seductive environment you know it had you know i could i could already recognize and tell that there was a relationship between this trainer in the water with the whales and and you know for i think almost all trainers that's what it's about it's about having that relationship with that animal um so um since six years old as crazy as that sounds i was single-mindedly obsessed about achieving it. I was, I was even writing letters to SeaWorld as a young child and getting answers. They would write me back. And I just pursued it until um, they hired me at age 20. It was when I started as an apprentice trainer in 1993 at age 20. Now, you worked your way up through the ranks. You, you've trained these animals all over the world, not just in the United States. Uh, uh, this is your passion, man. This is your, this is your love. You, know, you love to do this. When did you decide to quit, and, and what was the driving force behind quitting? You know, that is such a hard and a hard question to answer quickly because it's such a um, it's not like a one word or a one event thing that happened. It's a progressive thing that happened. So, you know, when you want to get into it in the beginning, and when you first get into it, you you don't believe or have any reasons to believe that anything is wrong. You, you think these animals live, live perfect lives and you're going to live a perfect life. This magical existence with you and the whales, just as you had envisioned as a six year old. Uh, but then you realize it's a business. Then you realize things are happening that are not in the best interest of the animals. And then as you become um, a higher rank trainer and you have the experience and you are promoted up through the ranks, you do realize and understand fully what's happening to these animals in captivity. So you realize what's normal from abnormal and healthy from unhealthy and, and the decisions that are being made that are actually hurting the animals. But then you have to power through the fact that this isn't just like, hey, I don't like my boss today. I'm going to go quit working at Kinko's. And I'm going to go work at uh, the UPS store. You have invested your entire identity as a child and a young adult into this profession. And you are so invested in these relationships with these animals. It, you can't just walk out the door because you're abandoning these animals that you love with all your heart. But there's something seriously wrong with what's going on and what you're doing. So it's a huge conflict. And it takes a while, um, you know, to break through that. For me, um, what really started to break down for me is when we really started to artificially inseminate the whales and then separating the mothers from the calves. And that was, the, uh, you know, the number one prior to the company. And uh, I, especially when it was happening to whales that I was closest to, 
watching that happening over and over again, it was just such a disgusting, immoral, and unethical thing, I believe, that was happening. Uh, that really started to tear down my um, just loyalty to the company. You know, I was, I was a steward loyal, loyalist for many, many years and believed in that company. And, um, and then from there, you know, I'll, I had a lot of fallouts with management over decisions being made, exploiting the animals for show purposes, sticking whales in, the, in a pool for hours on end in, in an eight-foot-deep pool that was the dimensions of a backyard swimming pool for a human being. And then at the end, of course, uh, two colleagues and one who was a friend of mine were killed. You know, someone like myself who's been to these type of shows, you know, go there strictly for, for just the entertainment. You know, we don't think about how an animal is treated. And, and to be honest, and I know it's been out for a, for a long time now, but I and my wife just recently seen Blackfish, and it, and it really, really opened my eyes. I mean, how did you yourself become involved with this documentary? And explain, if you would, what this documentary is about to people who might not have seen it like myself. So Blackfish, really, Gabriella Capperthwaite is the director of Blackfish. She did an excellent job. And um, really, the, the, the main focal point of the movie, um, a lot of people like to say it's Tillicum killing Don because that was the other death. Alexis was killed by Keto. And then Don Branshaw, who, was, who I had known personally for nine years, was dis killed and dismembered by Tillicum, who's in Florida. But the movie is really about that it's unethical to keep these keep killer whales in captivity and the consequences of keeping these domestic animals in captivity, what happens to them and what happens to the trainers as a result. So that was really the premise of the documentary is to, um, as Gabriella likes to say, like peel back the onion, like, you know, you're, you're um, letting people see things that they've never seen before. Because like you said, when you go and you see these shows, People shouldn't feel guilty that in the past they went to see these parks. Um, I get it. People people want to go because you want to see these animals. They're amazing. They're impressive. It's the same reason why I wanted to do it since I was a child. But what people need to understand is that at what price do these whales pay for you to be able to go to a SeaWorld park and then leave that day with your family to go back to your home and have your freedom of choice and your freedom of your life, what what price did those whales have to pay for you to have a good day at SeaWorld? And once you realize it, and once you're educated with that, then I think there's really no turning back. And so, you know, I, you know, I get people all the time, and they're like, you know, I feel so guilty that I, and I'm like, no, don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. It, it, it's, we didn't know better. We didn't know any better back then but that's part of evolving is that we do learn things and, and we become better educated and that's what this is all about you know i'm going to play devil's advocate here for a second and ask you something that kind of you've already answered and but someone else might be thinking this right if you knew these whales were being treated so inhumanely why stay for as long as you did to see it on a daily basis it's kind of like how I answered earlier. It's, you know, at first I would say, um, you know, in the beginning you don't see anything wrong because you don't have any experience. And by the time you start to see things, it's, it's progressive. It's not like all of a sudden you see every single thing that's against the animal's welfare. You progressively start to see things. And the more experience you have, the more things that you see, the more things that you do. But at that point, you're fighting losing your identity. You're fighting what do you get for financial income. You're fighting the biggest thing which gets lost in all of this battle is that you're leaving animals that you truly love and have spent years of your life with. And that's the most brutal part of it. So that's what keeps you there. So you, you feel like, okay, you're a high-ranked trainer. You're going to try to fight and you're going to make changes from the inside, and then you realize you don't have that level of power. You can't stop corporate SeaWorld from 
artificially intimidating whales at uh, unnaturally young ages or unnaturally short intervals and separating mothers from calves, just as one example of, I could give you probably 50, but we don't have time for that. Right. So it's just, a, it's, a, it's progressive. Um, so, but yeah, I've been asked that question. People will say, well, when you knew this was happening, why did you say, and, you know, and that's the best way that you can, you know, explain it to someone that it's, it's not like a normal job that you just go, okay, I'm fed up with this. That's not right. I'm leaving. You have to battle through a lot of serious, deeply embedded emotional things within yourself to be able to walk away from those whales. Because that's tough. You love those whales more than anything, and it's your identity. Now, by you and your colleagues coming out with information like this, you've had to have faced opposition from SeaWorld themselves. Are they, are they staging their own PR campaign against you and, and what you and your former trainers are trying to bring to the limelight? Oh, they've always done that. Anybody that, anyone in the past, and even to this day, who criticizes their business model, even like celebrities, this comes to the top of my head, like Cher. Um, one of the people that SeaWorld hired uh, called Cher a pig behind a keyboard because Cher said that she hated SeaWorld and she would never visit SeaWorld. So, and, then, you know, Cher is just one uh, A-list celebrity. The list is so long that of celebrities who have come out and said, look, I will never perform at SeaWorld. I will never go. I don't agree with them. I don't agree with the way that they exploit their animals for profit and for greed and for entertainment. I just don't know. We're doing, we have so many people, so many fantastic, legendary artists and celebrities um, that uh, are against SeaWorld because they now know the truth. And they're, you know, they, they realize that SeaWorld is lying lying to the public and hiding things from the public for you know decades and just real quick and i know there's a a lot more that can be discussed like you said and just because of time restraints what is just a couple of things that that are different from a, a killer whale in captivity from a whale that's that's in the wild that that just cannot be denied by sea world so in, in sea world you will notice animals just floating motionless on the surface of the water for hours on end, or they'll be floating. They'll sink to the bottom of the pool and they'll just stare at a concrete wall and they'll come up, take a breath, go down and just stare at a concrete wall, or they'll stare at a concrete wall at the surface. You'll see collapsed dorsal fins, which is the result of them just floating motionless at the surface of the water, because in the wild they would be swimming up to or over 100 miles a day, sometimes every single day, and in straight lines, and their dorsal fins are supported by that water. And when they live in such a horrifically sterile environment and there's nothing for them to do, they're just floating, like lifeless, like they're, like they're dead inside, you know. Their, their body is alive, but their spirit is dead because their, their freedom is gone. And they're, they're contained in these blue-painted concrete walls. Um, and it's just, and there's so many side effects from being in an environment like that. Those animals are so pumped full of medications that we hide from the public. We don't tell the public about. I mean, I've told interviewers before, ask the world right now, how many of your whales are on medications and why? And watch them squirm. I mean, they're pumped so full of medications from everything from antibiotics, from all kinds of infections, to um, uh, uh, tagamet, to treat ulcer, uh, you know, uh, chronic ulcers from stress. Uh, we have to manually drill their teeth because they, they, gr they wear down their teeth by uh, rubbing them on the concrete from boredom. They fracture them from biting the ledges and, and stages out of frustration and the steel bars on the gate. There's so many things um, that result from them being in captivity. And even with all of the medication and even with all of the, the teeth drilling and all these things, these animals still die so horrifically young. You know, we have whales that, you know, commonly die in their, you know, early teens or, you know, if they're lucky enough to even make it to 20, 
Um, and in the wild, they would easily be living to 60 to 80 years old. And SeaWorld likes to, you know, go jump on the fact that, oh, well, right now we have a, you know, a 47-year-old whale. Well, that's one whale, and in your entire history, you've owned 67 killer whales. So, you know, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that Corky, that's the whale that's, um, you know, her age is a little bit of a de- debate because she was, of course, captured from the wild. Um, but she is roughly 47, 48 years old. But um, one whale that's that age out of 67 whales is not a, um, is not a success. It's the exception you know, you to the whale. The other ages. Absolutely. I did an op-ed recently where I, I listed in the last 10 years the killer whales that have died at SeaWorld. Because SeaWorld, they're, out of their own words, they have described themselves as the, as, the, as the most advanced facility in the world and the most, their most recent 10 years is the most advanced period for their superior medical care. Well, in the last 10 years, eight killer whales have died, and the average age of those eight orcas that died in those 10 years was 12.5 years old. That's how old they were when they died. That was the average of those eight that have died. 12.5 years compared to 60 to 80 years in the wild. Yes, you do have some whales that are uh, in their 30s, and you have one whale who is in her 40s. But again, those are exceptions to the rule. When you look at all of the total number of whales that SeaWorld has owned, and these are, and this, you don't have to take my word on it. These are official government documents that they have to keep. So you can look them up yourself and you can see all the whales that they've owned, the ages that they died and what they died from. And you can do your own averages. But what's so astonishing is that SeaWorld still says, that their whales in captivity are living just as long as their wild counterparts. That's just a bull-faced lie. It's just unbelievable. And they still say that they don't separate mothers from their calves. And I can tell you from my personal experience, we took at least 19 calves away from their mother. These whales, they live, they live in their family units for their entire life. You know, the sons never leave their mother for their entire life or their, you know, in very close proximity range to their mothers for their entire life. And then when you see SeaWorld not only um, forcibly, artificially inseminate these whales and force these pregnancies on them, but then by force take their calves away. And I've even seen them take calves away while they were still nursing. So Keith, when he was taken from his mother, Tolina, he was only 20 months old and he was still nursing because I was an apprentice and I had to do, um, you know, I had, as an apprentice, you can't do much. So I was out there in the, in the winter recording his respirations and how often he was nursing and, you know, and he would come up and he would have milk in his mouth and he was only 20 months old. And then they shipped Colina back to Florida. So when you see these examples and then when they and they keep lying about it. They keep lying and say, we don't separate mothers from their calves. When you can prove it in, in government documents, you can prove it when you know who the whales are and you can tell which, you know, so many people now on the Internet, you know where every whale is at which park. You can tell they're in different parks or even in different countries. But SeaWorld still will, will not tell the truth. They will maintain, you know what it reminds me of? And before, I've always refused to say this in, in interviews because I thought it was too inflammatory and now I really don't care. Um, you know, when we invaded Iraq, and it was, um, you'll probably correct me here, I believe it was the Iraqi interior minister, and he did this press conference that was live, and he was trying to assure his, all of his country men who were in panic, believing that the Amer- that we, the Americans, had just invaded the country. And he was saying, and of course this was broadcast worldwide, and he was saying, no, you know, it's all a lot. The Americans are not here. They are not in our country. Uh, there's no way they're getting in. Meanwhile, not only were we already in the country, we had already taken over their airport, everything. And it was just 
it always makes me think of that every time I see SeaWorld say, we don't separate mothers from their calves. You know, we, you know, we, we don't do this. We don't do that. And it just reminds me of him saying that because it's like, it's so easily proven that what you're saying is a lie, but you're still, you're still lying. It's, it's already shifted. The dominoes have fallen. SeaWorld does not have the power that they used to have because they had the power before because nobody knew what was going on. No one was able to get in inside because it, it was such a secret world. And now we've uncovered all that. And now, you know, people like myself and other trainers that were in Blackfish that also testified, um, you know, we have spoken about our experiences and what truly happened. And, uh, you know, as you announced, I, I've, uh, you know, I did the documentary. I also wrote a book. And then also myself and some of the other former trainers in, uh, that were in Blackfish, former SeaWorld, now we are involved in the legislative action, uh, both in California and in the federal, on the federal level. And, um, you know, so we are, it, it's out there, it's uncovered, I mean, it's not a secret anymore, and they can't control it. So once, once it's no longer a secret and they can't control it, they're losing all these court cases and all this information comes out in discovery, I mean, then, you know, the gig is up. Yeah, and, and, if, and if I'm not mistaken, you and everyone else who are fighting this battle had good news. Uh, was it just the other day with SeaWorld announcing they're canceling their, their Orca shows by 2017? But it's but it's just right one city, right? Well, it, it, that was a total sham. It's, uh, they, they're they not canceling their shows. What they did was they, uh, they're, you know, well, first of all, I got to take you back to the Cal California Coastal Commission. You know, they had to get a permit from the California Coastal Commission to build a uh, $100 million new pool that they wanted to expand. And um, the California Coastal Commission, and they, and they said it, they said they wanted to build it to give the animals a better life, a better give them uh, better habitat, and therefore better a better uh, well better welfare and better life. Well, the California Coastal Commission then said, "Well, are you going to use this pool and still continue to breed your whales? Because their breeding now is not natural. They're crossbreeding whales, which are creating hybrid whales that would never breed in the wild." Uh, you know, so two different two different ecotypes of whales that would never breed in the wild, but due to confinement now they are breeding. So that's creating hybrid whales that don't exist in the natural world. And now you're also seeing a lot of uh, insects, and you don't see that in nature either. So uh, they will not inbreed um, in the wild, but in captivity they've been inbreeding now for years. So you and I both know the problems associated, and all of your listeners know the problems associated with that so the so sea world answered the uh, the commissioners well yes we're still going to breed them so they said well then no you can't we're not going to grant the uh, give you the permit they said if you would like to build the hundred million dollar pool to give those wells a better life then we will give you the permit so sea world said no we're not going to build the pool and we're going to sue you so Proof right there that they were never building the pool to give those whales a better life. They were only going to build that pool so they could continue to build whales that don't even exist in the natural world. They're scientifically engineered whales that just profit and breed. But so when that when that bombed, which was a couple of weeks ago, then they had to rally because of the bad PR. So they're their rally to that bad PR was to make some type of announcement. So their announcement was, hey, guys, guess what? Of course, I'm paraphrasing. Hey, guys, guess what? We're going to give you a new orca experience in 2017. Well, what they were hoping is that it would, you know, send off and, you know, more bad PR, maybe get some investor um, confidence back, and listen, their stock dropped. I mean, yesterday it closed in 16. I think it closed at 16. The market closed. But the opposite effect, and it as it should have, because who, who makes an announcement like that? Could you be more vague? 
to say that we're going to give you a new orca experience and not give you any details is because they don't even know what those details are. They're just scrambling, just like they scrambled in August of 2014 when their stock plunged 33% in one day. And then that's when they announced that they were going to build a $100 million expansion pool that now they're saying they're not going to build and they're going to sue the California Coastal Commission over. So, um, and, and my point about their new ORCA experience is that it doesn't even matter what it is or what it turns out to be. As long as those whales are still in captivity, they're still in captivity. They're still going to be staring at concrete walls. They're still going to be regurgitating their food from boredom and grinding down and wearing down their teeth where we have to manually drill them. They're still going to be dying early. They're still going to be pumped full of drugs. You know, to me and to, and to everyone who's involved in this, this is a very simple answer. Until they agree to stop their captive breeding program, this controversy is not going to go away, and they're not going to survive this. They can, they can survive, and I would like for them to survive as a company without animals in captivity. If they, you know, they, they could, you know, evolve to, a, you know, rides like Universal Studios. They have incredible rides. They could do fantastic stuff with the right imagination but without having to cage animals, rob them of their freedom, um, you know, take their calves away from their mothers when they're supposed to stay together for life. Like, these animals should be in their natural environment. They should not be in captivity. Other countries in the world have already beat us to this and have already said that it's illegal and that it's not allowed. So a United States is just trying to play catch-up. So... Um, so as, as long as they have, as long as they refuse to end their captive breeding program, then um, they're going to continue to tank, and we're going to still go after them, and nobody's going to stop. Well, John, is there any anything else you would like to add that I failed to mention before we start to bring things to a close here here on the show? I know you haven't got a chance to mention a website or social media. Or, or actually your book that you've written, Beneath the Surface, Killer Whales, Sea World, and the Truth Behind Blackfish. Where can our listeners go to get more information about that and your goal? Oh, thank you. Um, I have a website. It's johnhargrove.nyc. Um, and also you can find me on Twitter at John J. Hargrove. The book, of course, you can get it anywhere, Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon. I don't want to sound too much like a used car sale. <laughs> I hear you, man. Well, John, I want to thank you so much for taking time out and speaking with me today. And best of luck in what you're trying to accomplish. And, and, and just so you know, uh, me and my family are behind you 100%. Thank you so much. And thank you for allowing me to just, you know, get more information out there. Because, you know, at the end of the day, this is not about me. This is not about anybody else this is about these whales and we need to make this the last generation of killer whales in captivity that's our goal and we're going to make it happen whether sea world likes it or not Radio show.